Hi guys, I'm Erica. Welcome to Hack Your Health. In today's video, I'm going to talk about fermenting food. And I'm going to direct this mostly towards people that are new to the topic and new to fermentation itself. So first I'll talk a little bit about the benefits and the reasons to ferment food. And then I'll talk a little bit about the process of fermenting and how you can make it go better when you try it. So personally, I got into fermenting food when I was healing my digestive system and I was specifically healing Crohn's disease and a woman who had had similar symptoms at a similar age to me and gone on to live a healthy life highly recommended that I start making and eating sauerkraut, kefir, and kombucha. And so I did that, and that was about eight years ago now, so it's been about eight years since I started experimenting with fermenting foods. The first benefit that I would share with you is that these are very beneficial for people who are healing their digestion or who would like to improve their digestive health or even just maintain it. And the main reason for that is because well, actually, there's more than one main reason, I suppose, but one of the most important reasons is that fermenting food breaks down the carbohydrates in the food. So carbohydrate digestion occurs in our small intestine usually, and basically there's certain cells and certain enzymes, and essentially the walls of your intestinal tract need to be in pretty good repair in order for carbohydrate digestion to happen properly and for people with ulcerated intestines and stuff like that sometimes that wall of the intestine is so damaged that carbohydrate digestion isn't happening properly and so when you're eating fermented foods the bacteria have already broken down the carbohydrates into lactic acid usually if it's bacterial fermentation before you eat it so people who aren't in a place where they're able to digest carbohydrates properly can often eat fermented food with better results. And it also puts beneficial bacteria into the food and that can, for one thing, compete with bad bacteria, but it can also help your immune system in general by protecting the walls of your intestinal lining. And it can also do things like help with mood. There's studies that show that depression and anxiety can be helped by consuming certain kinds of probiotics and those kinds of probiotics are found in certain fermented foods so it kind of is a combination of the food being pre-digested and therefore less work needing to be done by the body as well as containing beneficial microorganisms that can help with your digestion as well. The second benefit of fermenting food is that it improves the longevity of the food and it allows you to take advantage of an abundance of something that's in season and then preserve it for times when that food might be scarce. So in our modern times, fermentation has become a lot less popular, basically because we've come up with other ways of preserving food, such as using chemical preservatives or heating to very high temperatures, such as like pasteurization and removing all the bacterias or ex limiting the exposure to oxygen. There's all different kinds of ways that we've come up with to preserve food. And in traditional times, we didn't have access to all of those more industrial strategies for food preservation, and we largely relied on fermenting foods. So for at least 10,000 years, our ancestors were fermenting foods as a way to preserve them and keep them safe to consume for a long period of time. It's still beneficial to ferment food because it allows you to take advantage of food when it's freshest. For example, fresh fruit and fresh vegetables which have just been harvested and that's when they're at their peak of nutritional value as well as when they're the least expensive and perhaps in some cases even free to obtain. So you can really take advantage of a large quantity of something and make it into a value added and desirable product. So an example of that would be apples could be apple cider or apple cider vinegar. You can make sauerkraut, you can make cheese, uh, even meat can be made into salami, although that's a bit different type of fermentation. And basically there's all different ways of fermenting foods and all different kinds of products that can be made 
And that brings me to my third point, which is that the flavor and the variety of your diet really benefits from fermenting foods. For example, the difference between tea and kombucha or cabbage and sauerkraut. There's a more sour and fuller flavor involved when you ferment foods. And it also improves the nutrition. So a lot of the times B vitamins and vitamin C content goes up a lot when you ferment foods, especially cabbages and vegetables. And it also neutralizes a lot of anti-nutrients. So anti-nutrients are things like phytic acid, for example, which when eaten alongside minerals such as calcium or iron will bind to the mineral and prevent its absorption. And they do have other effects as well. But in terms of mineral absorption, it can really be improved by fermenting foods because the phytic acid will be neutralized and therefore the minerals that are in that grain or vegetable or whatever you're fermenting will be available to your body to absorb and use. And of course, it cannot be overlooked that fermenting foods is really fun and it's an experiment. It's sort of like a science experiment that you get to enjoy the product of. So you can be really creative. You can adjust recipes to your own taste. You can increase or decrease the salt content, for example, to your own taste, as long as it's within the bounds of what will work. And basically you can use any different kind of ingredient and it gives you a huge amount of freedom to create something that you really enjoy eating. So now let's get into a little bit about the basics of what you're really trying to accomplish when you're fermenting food. So there's three different main classifications of fermentation. So there's yeast only, which the yeast will digest the glucose or the carbohydrates and produce ethanol, which is alcohol. So that's like beer, wine, and other alcoholic beverages are fermented by yeast. And then there's a combination of yeast and bacteria. So that's often called a SCOBY and that's kombucha, kefir, I believe sourdough as well. So in that case, there's yeast that breaks down the carbohydrate into alcohol. And then there's a bacteria that digests the alcohol and turns it into acid, so lactic acid. So the final product will contain mostly acid, but a very small amount of alcohol because there's always gonna be some that's just been produced by the yeast and not yet broken down by the bacteria. But since they exist in a symbiotic balance, the alcohol content will never be high. It will always be low. Then there is bacterial fermentation, which produces lactic acid. So the bacteria breaks down the sugars and turns it into lactic acid. And lactic acid is very beneficial for us when we eat it. So the first thing to consider is that this is a anaerobic reaction. So when you're fermenting these foods or liquids or whatever it is, you want to make sure that you don't expose what you're trying to ferment to oxygen. So for example, when you're using a container and then you're making sour sauerkraut in it, you want to make sure that all of the vegetables and all of the cabbage or whatever it is, is completely submerged in brine. And you might even want to use something to keep it down. So what I do is I put a cabbage leaf and I press down so that cabbage leaf is completely submerged. And you'll probably want to use a similar strategy. If it's a liquid, it already basically submerges itself and there can be a little bit of room. And that is actually another point is that you don't want to ever fill the container all the way to the top when you're fermenting things. And you want to make sure that it can expand because as things ferment, they often create gas because CO2 is one of the byproducts of the chemical breakdown of the carbohydrates. So that's what makes pop fuzzy, for example. I mean, that's not really a fermentation process, they just add it in, but the fermentation process will carbonate beverages sort of like pop. So you have to make sure that for one thing, you don't seal the container completely unless it's a container that's meant to produce carbonation to allow the escape of gas or else the container might explode. And you also need to make sure that you don't fill it all the way up to the top because it could just leak out. 
So be prepared for whatever you're fermenting to expand or release gas during the fermentation process. Not everything does this. For example, yogurt doesn't seem to expand while it's fermenting. However, kefir does. So I would err on the side of caution and leave a little bit of room. And you also want to keep in mind that you're trying to create an environment that's suitable for the kind of bacteria or yeast that you're trying to culture and create a fermentation with and you want to make it an undesirable environment for all the other bacterias out there. So for example, you'll probably be using salts if you're fermenting vegetables and you want to have it at a 2 to a 5% ratio of salt to water by weight. And you can usually kind of eyeball it or follow a recipe, but it's very important to use enough salt because that inhibits the, the growth of most kinds of bacteria, but will not fully inhibit the growth of the bacteria, which will break down the vegetables. So without the salt, it would just be a free-for-all and you really don't want that. <laughs> and you also want to pay attention to the temperature. So usually room temperature is good, but if it's too cold, the rate might be too slow and that could potentially allow other bacteria to take over or allow spoilage before it gets fermented properly. And if the temperature is too high, then it might go too fast and basically not ferment properly either. And there are other ways to inhibit the bad bacteria. For example, you could use citric acid because acid also inhibits the growth of bacteria and the fermentation process itself will release either acid or alcohol, which will also further inhibit. So this is mostly, I think, to make sure that at the beginning phases, those bacteria have the chance to take over and then they'll kind of naturally exclude everything else as they're growing. It's also very important to make sure that you use clean containers and clean utensils because you don't want to accidentally introduce any other bacterias or yeasts into your mix. You want to make sure that the ones that you want to grow are the only ones that are there. So usually that means that you boil your containers or put them in the oven for a while or sterilize them somehow. Make sure that they're clean and dry before you put anything in them. And it's also a good idea to sterilize any of the stuff that you're using. So if you're using a mixing spoon or if you're using a measuring cup or anything, it's a good idea to just make sure that you sterilize all of it at the beginning so that you don't accidentally introduce bad bacteria or yeast that you don't want. Personally, I am not the best at being super strict about this though I know that for certain things it's more important than others. For example, beer and wine making, um, I'm under the impression that it's even more important to make sure everything's sterilized than if you're doing something like fermenting vegetables, but it is important no matter what, so it's a good habit to get into to just sterilize everything. The reason I say that I'm not the pickiest is to kind of communicate that it doesn't need to be absolutely perfect all the time. And I mean, if you look back in history, people didn't necessarily have the means to sterilize absolutely everything. And yet they were eating a lot of fermented foods. So I would recommend trusting the process, doing your best to make sure everything's clean, but not getting upset if you accidentally use a spoon that you didn't boil or something like that. So definitely check out your final product, make sure that it looks good and it smells like it should and everything checks out and then, you know, make your decision based on your observations. That's my strategy at least. And I'd also recommend being somewhat organized when you start to ferment things. Having similarly sized jars can be really helpful and also having a designated space such as a cupboard or another dark place that you can keep your finished product as it ferments because it'll take 
anywhere from a day or two to a few weeks, depending on what it is that you're making, or even longer if it's something that has multiple stages of fermentation. So I really hope that this has been helpful to you. It's just meant to be a little bit of an introduction. And if you're interested in making specific foods, I'll create a playlist of the fermented foods that I already have on my channel. And you can check those out if you like. And if you have any recommendations of fermented food that you'd like me to make, let me know because I'm interested in trying out more variety. And so subscribe if you want to see those videos. And if you like this video, please let me know by pushing like. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions stories or personal experiences or anything else that you'd like to share please do so in the comments below and thank you so much for watching and all the best on your healing journey okay bye